To Nathaniel Hawthorne, 1st of June, 1851, Pittsfield. My dear Hawthorne, I should have been rumbling down to you in my pine board chariot a long time ago, were it not that for some past weeks I have been more busy than you can well imagine, out of doors, building and patching and tinkering away in all directions. Besides, I had my crops to get in, corn and potatoes, I hope to show you some famous ones by and by, and many other things to attend to, all accumulating upon this one particular season. I work myself, and at night my bodily sensations are akin to those I have so often felt before when a hired man doing my day's work from sun to sun, but I mean to continue visiting you until you tell me that my visits are both supererogatory and superfluous. With no son of man do I stand upon any etiquette or ceremony, except the Christian ones of charity and honesty. I am told, my fellow man, that there is an aristocracy of the brain. Some men have boldly advocated and asserted it. Schiller seems to have done so, though I don't know much about him. At any rate, it is true that there have been those who, while earnest in behalf of political equality, still accept the intellectual estates. All, and I can well perceive, I think, how a man of superior mind can, by its intense cultivation, bring himself, as it were, into a certain spontaneous aristocracy of feeling, exceedingly nice and fastidious, similar to that which, in an English Howard, conveys a torpedo-fish thrill at the slightest contact with a social plebeian. So when you see or hear of my ruthless democracy on all sides, you may possibly feel a touch of a shrink or something of that sort. It is but nature to be shy of a mortal who boldly declares that a thief in jail is as honorable a person as General George Washington. This is ludicrous, but truth is the silliest thing under the sun. Try to get a living by the truth and go to the soup societies. Heavens, let any clergyman try to preach the truth from its very stronghold the pulpit, and they would ride him out of his church on his own pulpit banister. It can hardly be doubted that all reformers are bottomed upon the truth, more or less, and to the world at large are not reformers almost universally laughing stocks? Why so? Truth is ridiculous to men. Thus easily in my room, here do I, conceited and garrulous, reverse the test of my Lord Shaftesbury. It seems an inconsistency to assert unconditional democracy in all things, and yet confess a dislike to all mankind in the mass, but not so. But it's an endless sermon, no more of it. I began by saying that the season I have, been, I have not been to Linux is this. In the evening I feel completely done up, as the phrase is, and incapable of the long jolting to get to your house and back. In a week or so I go to New York to bury myself in a third-story room and work and slave on my whale while it is driving through the press. That is the only way I can finish it now. I am so pulled hither and thither by circumstances, the calm, the coolness, the silent grass-growing mood in which a man ought always to compose, that I fear can seldom be mine. Dollars damn me, and the malicious devil is forever grinning in upon me, holding the door ajar. My dear sir, a presentiment is upon me. I shall at last be worn out and perish, like an old nutmeg grater, grated to pieces by the constant attrition of the wood, that is, the nutmeg. What I feel most moved to write, that is banned, it will not pay. Yet altogether write the other way, I cannot. So the product is a final hash, and all my books are botches. I'm rather sore, perhaps, in this letter. But see my hand, four blisters on this palm, made by hoes and hammers within the last few days. It is a rainy morning, so I am indoors, and all work suspended. I feel cheerfully disposed, and therefore I write a little bluely. Would the gin were here, if ever, my dear Hawthorne, in the eternal times that are to come, you and I shall sit down in paradise, in some little shady corner by ourselves, and if we shall by any means be able to smuggle a basket of champagne there, I won't believe in a temperance heaven, and if we shall then cross our celestial legs in the celestial grass that is forever, forever tropical, and strike our glasses and our heads together till both musically ring in concert, then, O oh my dear fellow mortal, how shall we pleasantly discourse of all the things manifold which now so distress us? When all the earth shall be but a reminiscence, yea, its final dissolution and antiquity. Then shall songs be composed, as when wars are over, humorous, comic songs. O oh, when I lived in that queer little hole called the world, or, 
Oh, when I toiled and sweated below, or, oh, when I knocked and was knocked in the fight. Yes, let us look forward to such things. Let us swear that, though now we sweat, yet it is because of the dry heat, which is indispensable to the nourishment of the vine, which is to bear the grapes that are to give us the champagne hereafter. But I was talking about the whale. As the fishermen say, he's in his flurry. When I left him some three weeks ago, I'm going to take him by his jaw, however, before long, and finish him up in some fashion or other. What's the use of elaborating what, in its very essence, is so short-lived as a modern book? Though I wrote the Gospels in this century, I should die in the gutter. I talk all about myself, and this is selfishness and egotism, granted. But how help it? I am writing to you. I know little about you, but something about myself. So I write about myself, at least to you. Don't trouble yourself, though, about writing, and don't trouble yourself about visiting, and when you do visit, don't trouble yourself about talking. I will do all the writing and visiting and talking myself. By the way, in the last Dollar magazine, I read The Unpardonable Sin. He was a sad fellow, that Ethan Brand. I have no doubt you are by this time responsible for many a shaken tremor of the tribe of general readers. It is a frightful poetical creed that the cultivation of the brain eats out the heart. But it's my prose opinion that in most cases, in those men who have fine brains and work them well, the heart extends down to hams. And though you smoke them with the fire of tribulation, yet like veritable hams, the head only gives the richer and the better flavor. I stand for the heart. To the dogs with the head. I had rather be a fuel with a fool with a heart than Jupiter Olympus with his head. The reason the mass of men fear God and at bottom dislike him is because they rather distrust his heart and fancy him all brain like a watch. You perceive I employ a capital initial in the pronoun referring to the deity. Don't you think there is a slight dash of flunkyism in that usage? Another thing, I was in New York for four and twenty hours the other day and saw a portrait of N.H. And I have seen and heard many flutterings many flattering, in a publisher's point of view, allusions to the Seven Gables. And I have seen tales and a new volume announced by N.H. So upon the whole, I say to myself, this N.H. is in ascendant. My dear sir, they begin to patronize. All fame is patronage. Let me be infamous. There is no patronage in that. What reputation H.M. has is horrible. Think of it. To go down to posterity is bad enough anyway, but to go down as a man who lived among the cannibals, when I speak of posterity in reference to myself, I only mean the babies who will probably be born in the moment immediately ensuing upon my giving up the ghost. I shall go down to some of them, in all likelihood. Type E will be given to them, perhaps with their gingerbread. I have come to regard this matter of fame as the most transparent of all vanities. I read Solomon more and more, and every time see deeper and deeper and unspeakable meanings in him. I do not think of fame a year ago as I do now. My development has been all within a few years past. I am like the one of those seeds taken out of the Egyptian pyramids, which after being three thousand years a seed and nothing but a seed, being planted in English soil, it developed itself, grew to greenness, and then fell to mold. So I, until I was 25, I had no development at all. From my 25th year, I date my life. Three weeks have scarcely passed at any time between then and now that I have not unfolded within myself. But I feel that I am now come to the inmost leaf of a bulb, and that shortly the flower must fall to the mold. It seems to me now that Solomon was the truest man who ever spoke, and yet that he a little managed the truth with a view to popular conservatism, or else there have been many corruptions and interpolations of the text. In reading some of Goethe's sayings, so worshipped by his votaries, I come across this. Live in the all. That is to say, your separate identity is but a wretched one. Good. But get out of yourself, spread and expand yourself, and bring to yourself the tinglings of life that are felt in the flowers and the woods, that are felt in the plan planets Saturn and Venus, and the fixed stars. What nonsense! Here is a fellow with a raging toothache. My dear boy, Goethe says to him, you are sorely afflicted with that tooth, but you must live in the all, Goethe, and then you'll be happy. 
As with all great genius, there is an immense deal of flummery in Goethe, and in proportion to my own contact with him, a monstrous deal of it in me. H. Melville. P.S. Amen, saith Hawthorne. N.B. This all feeling, though there is some truth in it, you must often have felt it. Lying on the grass on a warm summer's day, your legs seem to shoot, send out shoots into the earth. Your hair feels like leaves upon your head. This is the all feeling. But what plays the mischief with the truth is what is that men will insist upon the universal application of a temporary feeling or opinion. P.S. You must not fail to admire my discretion in paying the postage on this letter.